So, Lauren, do you remember who the first Super User Award winner was? Well, of course, it was the CERN team. It's hard to believe it's been two years since they won it in Paris. Wow, okay. So I think that's Tim Bell. I've been kind of <laughs> talking about him lately. But, uh, you know, you could say, I guess, that uh, OpenStack's synonymous with science, and science and OpenStack go together? Well, of course. So OpenStack was founded by Rackspace and NASA. So you could say that scientific research is really part of the DNA of the community. Amazing. Well, without further ado, I will introduce you to Tim Bell from CERN to tell us what they're up to these days. Thanks, Mark. Hello, and thank you for the chance to come along and give you an update on where we are with OpenStack at CERN. So if you were driving between Geneva and the Jura Mountains, you might go past this strange uh, globe. This is the CERN conference center. But behind it are the Atlas Experiment Control Buildings. So these are the surface buildings that are 100 meters above the largest machine on Earth. This is the Large Hadron Collider, 27 kilometers around, four experiments, and we fire around beams of protons in opposite directions and then collide them at the experiments. The experiments, so there are four. This one is CMS. Um, it stands for Compact Muon Solenoid. Um, it's a bit of a strange term given that it weighs 14,000 tons to call it compact. So when we fire these beams of protons round, what do we get? We get around 1 billion collisions every second. So each beam has bunches around 100 billion protons. They pass through each other at the experiments. And then out of that, we then get simultaneous collisions occurring inside the experiments. And this is one of the things that's driving the computing needs, which is that we have to be able to handle all those collisions and then separate them out into separate, different, and distinct collisions. But CERN isn't just the Large Hadron Collider. Um, I have the, the honor of having an antimatter factory just down the road from my office. <laughs> and there, what we do is we take antiprotons, positrons, anti-electrons, and slow them down, put them into orbit around each other, and create anti-hydrogen. This allows us to study items like, uh, does antimatter go up or down under gravity? We host at CERN also the control center for the AMS experiment, which is actually on the outside of the International Space Station, looking at the solar winds and particles from space without the problems of them having to come through the atmosphere. 2016 has been a, a great year for the LHC. Um, we've had extremely good performance. The beam has been very successful in staying in for extended periods of time, which leads to more collisions. We've got about half a petabyte a day coming in at the moment. Um, and with this, we're accumulating more. Um, currently, the data store is about 160 petabytes in total. But looking out, when we have a look at how we're going to be distracting these collisions from each other, then we're looking at about 60 times larger compute capacity required by 2023. Moore's law will only get us about a factor five less than that, even if we manage to keep that going. So how are we looking to address this need for scalability? So we started production with OpenStack in 2013. In 2014, in Paris, uh, we had 70,000 cores. We're now 190,000, which is roughly 90% of the compute capacity at CERN running on top of OpenStack. We do migration of long-running service VMs. We're doing around 5,000 this year. And we're currently looking in pros place the process to get around another 100,000 in the next six months. So with this, we have to have a platform that is scalable and that allows us to grow. But at the same time, the users are looking for more functionality, not just more capacity. So we've been looking at containers. The users have been very enthusiastic about reworking their applications for microservices. We've also had a number of collaborations with Rackspace and with the European Union Indigo Data Clouds to try and work out how best to apply containers to science. We've used the OpenStack Magnum project. This is attractive for us because we can use the existing OpenStack infrastructure, our security arrangements, our capacity planning, our accounting, and just add Magnum as an additional functionality rather than having to do the same thing with Mesos, OnePlace, Kubernetes, and other technologies. 
But at the same time, we have to look at how can we grow. And we've been looking at public clouds here. Um, for a couple of years, we've been running the Large Hadron Collider workloads on public clouds. We tried around 10 in total. The vast majority of these are open stack based. And what this allows us to do is to take the in-house tooling that we've been using for the on-premise cloud and use the same tooling for running on the public clouds. So thank you very much for all of your help. With communities like this, working groups like the scientific working group and the large deployment teams, we're going to be able to take on the computing challenges of CERN's experiments going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. So a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to visit the University of Cambridge and not only met with their infrastructure team who is working on OpenStack, but got to meet with some of their researchers who are using the OpenStack clouds. So Tim and CERN are working on one of the largest research projects in history right now, but we're about to hear from someone who might top that. From the University of Cambridge, please welcome Dr. Rosie Bolton. <laughs> Hi everyone, it's really good to be here to talk with you today. Um, so I think it's fair to say that the LHC that Tim was talking about is one of the most exciting things that's happened in, in physics recently. I'm going to tell you about the most exciting thing in physics that happen, hasn't happened yet, but it is going to happen. So the Square Kilometre Array project is a billion dollar plus project to build a 50 year lifetime radio observatory. I'm going to talk about the first phase of that. So the first phase of SKA will be finished in 2023 and will consist of two separate instruments, so two instruments, one observatory. These instruments will be in very remote desert sites, so the first one will be an array of antennas spread out in clusters along the in the Western Australian desert on baselines up to uh, 80 kilometers. Each of the little white specks is an antenna, an aerial the size of me. So that's in Australia. All these receivers work together as an interferometer. And the second instrument in the first phase will be an array of 197 dishes collecting radio signals, and they will be spread out across the South African Karoo Desert. Again, another interferometer. Now, SKA will be much more sensitive than any radio, te radio telescope that we have today, and that gives us access to lots of different science. So I want to just whet your appetite with two examples of the science we can do with SKA today. I have very little time to tell you more, but do find me afterwards, look, look me up. So if you have sensitivity, you can look deep into space. We can use the fact that if we can collect photons from very far away, we can see far back into the beginning of the universe. So this is a graphic showing how the universe is expanding. So the, down to the, to the left-hand side, we're looking at the very early universe, and then it's expanding along. We can see lots of structure in the universe here. SKA will be able to probe right back to the time when the first stars were switching on. And we will use the fact that SKA is going to be designed with 65,000 frequency channels to distinguish different emission from different parts of the universe very clearly. So an overall goal is to build up a survey of around a billion objects in three dimensions, and we can look at how the structure in the universe has evolved over time and compare it to our cosmological models to see if it's behaving as we would have expected it to do, and if not, to amend our models. So that's looking deep. But also, if you have sensitivity, you can look quickly as well. And a nice tool for doing that is to look at pulsars. I hope many of you will have heard of pulsars, but essentially, a pulsar is a dead star spinning very, very rapidly with the same mass as the sun, spinning around at a very high angular rate, and often with a magnetic field um, misaligned to the spin axis, which means that it can send out a beam of radio emission, rather like a lighthouse beam. If it happens to line up with us in Earth, and we see this rotating very clearly, like a, like a clock ticking along. Now, we already know about pulsars. We found several thousand of them. So the yellow points on this graphic show the pulsars that we've currently found in our own galaxy. You can see that they're actually clustered locally to our own location, which is the red circle at the top. With SKA, we predict we will find every single pulsar in our galaxy that is pointing towards us. That gives us access to a whole array of uh, surveys that we can do using the pulsars themselves as tools. Now, there's much, many different types of science. I'm going to just talk about my favorite one, which is represented by this graphic here. So if we have a nice survey of pulsars, we can choose a few tens of the best ones and, and choose them so they're spread out across the galaxy. And we can look at how their timing pips come in regularly. We can keep monitoring these timing pips. 
If a gravitational wave works its way across the fabric of our galaxy, some of the pulsars from one side will have the metric of space-time squashed between us and them, and on the other side, they'll have the metric of space-time stretched. That means that there will be an offset in the time delays of the pips coming in, one side to the other side. So we'll see one half of the sky coming in early, whilst the other half is coming in late, and we'll be able to infer a gravitational wave rippling through the galaxy. I think that's pretty nice science. So that's all the science I have time for. Let's talk about why it's difficult to work out how these things happen. So I've, luckily, I've said the two sites are very remote. They're in the desert in, uh, in South Africa and in Australia. But the, um, the processing centers are not in the desert. They are, they are down in Cape Town and in Perth. So we don't have to deal with off-site HPC. The, re the, the science data processes for SKA that I'm working on are the, the thinking brain of the, of, the, of the SKA. So it takes the signals that have been combined and then analyzes full data sets to ask, what is the model of the sky in the telescope that best fits these data? After the science data processor, we then have to pass the data to SKA regional centers, which will be globally distributed, which allow the scientists access to the data products to ask, was my experiment successful? How does it compare with the theory? So to make an analogy, the SDP, the science data processor, is like the conscious mind of the telescope. And we then have to pass the products on to the regional centers where the kind of cultural aspects and the community comparisons can be made in regional centers. OK. So let me give you some numbers. I'm going to skip this slide, being a bit too wordy. We have many challenges for SDP, the science data processor. The first is complexity. We have multi-axis data sets. We have iterative convergent pipelines that need to run, and we have to be able to predict how much time they will take to run. We need about half an exaflop of compute to do this. That's quite big. And we have to orchestrate the ingest, the processing, the control, the preservation and delivery of these data products. And we have to keep up with the incoming data. We are, of course, cost constrained. This is a public funded um, science project. The first phase has a, has a budget of 650 million euros. And the science data processor will be around 10% of that in total. So we don't have lots of money to throw around. Um, we're also going to be power constrained for the same reasons. We can't afford to switch on all of the compute that we might need. So we need to make things much more efficient than our current assumption of a 25% efficiency. We need to find ways of making things scale better. But we also have to design a system that has to allow for software and hardware refreshes over the 50-year lifetime. And when we think about the regional center and the delivery of the products to the scientists, we have to consider which facilities might be available in national infrastructure projects as well and how we build a federated system for that. So this is my summary slide. We have 400 gigabytes per second of data to ingest into the science data processor. Each, each graph of tasks for a six-hour observation will have around 400 million tasks in it, and we require around half an exaflop in total of peak. Um, this is my favorite. We need 1.3 zettabytes of intermediate data products for each six-hour data set. These are data that get created and then destroyed every six hours. Um, and in terms of final products, we need a petabyte a day of science data products to deliver to the rest of the world. So hopefully, that sounds interesting. Thank you. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Paul, Gle Paul, Paul Collegia, so he's going to talk about medical informatics. Hi, Rosie. Thanks, Paul. Oh, you've got one. Hi there. So it's really exciting today to be here talking about research computing at the OpenStack Summit, because I feel OpenStack technologies are now poised to make significant impact in the research and innovation domains. So we started our OpenStack journey in Cambridge about 18 months ago when we started to build a new research computing platform called the Cambridge Biomedical Cloud. The task of this platform is to take clinical data and applications from the university hospital environment and move those across to the research computing environment to drive medical analytics and computationally intensive biomedical research. So why would we use OpenStack? in the research computing environment. Well, from my perspective, from a provider's perspective, OpenStack technologies make computing, data, and applications more accessible, more flexible, and more secure. From the researcher's perspective, it makes research computing and data easier to use, 
easier to share for collaboration, and this decreases the time to science and increases innovation. So within our university hospital environment, we produce huge amounts of data, which is all now held in electronic record systems. This provides us with an ideal opportunity to apply big data technologies for improved health outcomes. But to do this, we need an IT platform which is secure, flexible, elastic, and lends itself to a sandboxed research computing environment. And OpenStack really meets all those requirements. So if we take a look at the biomedical cloud, we can see that it's a heterogeneous architecture with three main elements. There's a 2,000 core OpenStack element using 50 gigabit Ethernet that's RDMA enabled for performance. We have the traditional HPC cluster, static image-based system using 56 gigabit InfiniBand, that's 1,000 cores. And we have a, a, a currently quite a small Hadoop cluster which will be growing uh, at the beginning of next year. And there's quite a, a, a complex ethical sign-off and data sharing platform that takes data from the hospital network and moves that across to the research network under the correct regulatory compliance regimes. And then once we have that data in the research network, we can do interesting things with it. So how do we use that platform to develop new predictive medical analytics techniques? So firstly, we take various data warehouse products from Epic on the upper right-hand part of that diagram. These are patient test results, medical records, live telemetry feeds from the operating theatre, and we run that through predictive modelling uh, techniques to produce predictions. We can then test those predictions and enter into a device trial loop where we assess and refine that model until in the end we have something that we think can stand up as a new clinical treatment. So a really good example of this is work done by Dr. John Cromwell at Iowa University Hospital. John's developers developed a statistical model looking at surgical site infections that they run live while a patient is undergoing a procedure. And by using this model, they can cut surgical site infections by 58%. That's a really good example of how quite low-hanging fruit can develop large benefits uh, in the healthcare environment. So another use case we're working on in Cambridge is population-scale genomics analysis, and we've developed a new genomics an analysis platform called OpenCB using Hadoop infrastructure. This has been developed with Genomics England to undertake one of the largest population studies in the world, the UK 100K Genome Project, where we'll be looking at the genomes of 100,000 people. This OpenCB technology was already deployed on the BioCloud, and we're running that over a uh, UK 100K precursor project called the Bridge Project, where we're looking at 10,000 uh, patients' genomes with rare diseases. And we're seeing two orders of magnitude performance increase over previous platforms. So the last use case is actually, again, very interesting medical use case from the hospital. They deployed a new brain imaging machine. That's the brain imaging machine being installed on the left-hand side. This produced vast amounts of data, so the center needed a step function increase in its compute and data capability. OpenStack Medical Imaging VMs provides that step change, and that's now going into production, I think, in about a month's time. So when we started our journey, the scientific computing community was really quite nascent. That community has now been developed through the uh, scientific working group. I'd like to present Stig Telfer, who will tell us a little bit about that now. Hey there, Paul. Thank you. The science we've seen today ranges from the subatomic to the breathtakingly cosmic. From the beginning of time to the future of healthcare. Yet the computational challenges that these projects face have more in common than indifference. At an infrastructure level, they all face pretty much the same problems. These use cases are pretty typical 
in research computing, but they are not the default OpenStack use case. When you deploy OpenStack out of the box, this is not what you get. The scientists have to work a little bit harder at their configurations than the rest of us. This is the driving force behind OpenStack's scientific working group. Our open membership is drawn from institutions around the globe who use OpenStack to support science and research of this kind. We share knowledge with each other. We help each other out. We know what works and what doesn't. We fix a few things, and we share the results. Together as a working group, we advocate our use case for research computing among the wider OpenStack and research computing communities. I cannot believe that it has just been a short year and all this has happened. I cannot believe how much it has already helped us at Cambridge and our other members. With our working group now established, I know that we want to make an even bigger impact in the year to come. Our quest to understand the universe and to improve our little corner of it is going to be moved forward by ambitious scientific projects such as these we've just heard. To help them achieve this, compute hardware is going to get deployed on a massive scale. And upon that hardware, a platform must be built that meets the scientists' needs. In our group, we believe that platform should be OpenStack. And if you're interested in the problems and the solutions, I hope you'll join us in the working group and together, we'll make it happen. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Paul and Stig, for all of your contributions. We really appreciate it. And I just wanted to highlight one of the collaborative efforts that we did recently with the scientific working group, and including the foundation staff, um, put together a book about HPC and OpenStack. Maybe you can tell us a little about it. Yeah, we started out, we thought we'd, um, we'd do a survey of what was out there, get a baseline of knowledge, and we thought we'd write a few papers and get, get a few articles together. We found so much that we actually put together a book on the subject. And um, uh, here it is. So this is a book which is drawn from the expertise of a lot of the subject matter experts who are members of the working group. We got together, we contributed to create this publication. Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much for your work. We're actually going to have this available online and at the supercomputing conference in just a couple of weeks. So excited to participate there as well in, in your industry. So. And if you're interested, a lot of the authors will be at the Scientific Com Computing BOF, which is uh, Wednesday afternoon at 2.15. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Well, I hope you all enjoyed hearing from all these amazing members of the community and the users. We've got a very unique opportunity this week here in Barcelona to come together and do a lot of work that matters for these incredible users. I mean, if you think about, Rosie said she needs a half a exaflop of compute in a few years and a zettabyte every six hours. So we've got a lot of work left to do, but it really matters. It's gonna make a huge impact in the science and research community. Uh, but while we're out having work, let's also never forget to have a good time with OpenStack. Thank you very much. <laughs>